Good morning and welcome back. This is our fourth week of the Dorothy Marie Lowry Distinguished Guest Lecture Series. As I was standing at the table today, I was so pleased to see a number of new students joining us this week. And uh, can I get a show of hands who has enjoyed the first month of this? Lovely, very good. Um, we've had an exciting few weeks uh, with our speakers and I'm pleased uh, that uh, Greg Jenks, our faculty moderator, will be introducing today's speaker. A couple of you have asked, and I just want to do a couple housekeeping things. Um, many of you have asked related to the videoing, recording of the lecture series. That is being produced by Laguna Woods Village Television, and they have yet to send me the link. And so I will, as soon as we get those, I have Greg send those out. So please note that you can go back and listen to our speakers if you perhaps missed one or you wanted to revisit the wonderful information that our speakers have provided. Additionally, I wanted to let you know, and I believe Greg will also mention this too, um, next weekend is President's Day weekend, so we won't be having class next week Friday um, throughout the Emeritus Institute, and so not just this class as well. So those are just a couple housekeeping things. Um, thank you again uh, for joining us, and we look forward to today's lecture. Hey, good morning. We're all in our places. I got some smiles, happy faces. All right, we're good. We have a, a special treat this morning. I, I'm really excited. I just want to let you know that um, I sent a link out by email to people for last week's lecture. Some people want to know how to get the discount. Some, uh, uh, there's, Dr. D had uh, an offer, and I sent it by email. If you didn't get that, email me back. I'll send it out again. Um, and next week, like we heard, there's no meeting. Please have a lot of fun on President's Day. Please go out and celebrate your life in America and everything. Have good, but come back the week after. We're going to be talking about the Supreme Court, which is going to be very, very interesting. You're not going to want to miss that. Uh, USC professor is coming down to talk to us about that. So what else is there? Something else I was thinking. I think that's about it for now. If there is, I'll say something later. But I'm really happy to have each one of you here. Um, let me just introduce Dr. Lights to you all, Dr. Lisa Lights. Dr. Lisa Lights currently serves as the Delp Wilkinson Endowed Professor and the Department Chair of Peace Studies, and is also an Associate Professor of Sociology at Chapman University. Previously, she was an assistant professor at Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. She obtained a doctorate in sociology from the University of, of California, Santa Barbara, and her master's from Ohio State University, where she was a presidential fellow. Her research and teaching focuses on the role of identity and culture and attempts to make peace and address injustice. She has won the Chapman University Wilkinson College Student Choice for Excellence in Teaching and Mentoring Award in 2017, and the University's Excellence in Research Award in 2016. She is a Rotarian and has served on boards for peace organizations and veterans committees. Dr. Lights greatly enjoys using experiential learning to introduce students to data and new ideas. In addition to working closely with students on research and service projects in the areas around her campuses, she has led travel programs in the United States, Middle East, Europe, in Central America. Recently, she spearheaded Chapman University's successful effort to join Phi Beta Kappa, the oldest and most prestigious honor society in the United States. In November, Dr. Lights took the reins as the new editor-in-chief of the book series, Research and Social Movements, Conflict and Change, published by Emerald. And later this year, they'll release volume 43, Bringing Down Divides, which she is co-editing with Dr. Uh, Aiton Aimi, of Hebrew University in Israel. Her book, Fighting for Peace, Veterans and Military Families in the Anti-Iraq War Movement, was published in the University of Minnesota Press and won the 2015 American Sociological Association's Section on Peace, War, and Social Conflict Outstanding Book Award. Later, she was elected as chair of that ASA section and is currently serving on the Council for the ASA Section on Collective Behavior and Social Movements in addition to her publications about peace movements, she has also published other notable works covering women's activism, gender in militaries, private security forces in conflicts, veterans' health, 
and reintegration and physical fighting among girls. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Lisa Lights. I'm also a tremendous klutz, um, and so uh, I took a header uh, during the rain, and so sorry for the, the way I'm looking these days, but um, I think you all probably can understand how these things happen. Um, I, uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about my work, but I also um, I think it's important to give you guys some background, and, and I hope I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not uh, over giving you information you already know. I'll try to give you lots of new information, I promise. Um, OK. Is the microphone not on? OK. Cool. All right, so just a little bit of what we're going to be doing. So um, we're going to talk about the history and the, of uh, military activism, and we're going to look at it leading up to the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, um, and then Part of that will also be what's the context of those wars around uh, the military in particular. Um, then I'm going to introduce you to what I've called the military peace movement, um, particularly during the most recent set of wars. And then um, how we're going to talk about how do uh, veterans and military families manage what people see as a contradiction between being peace activists and being uh, connected to the military. And then uh, finally, we'll talk about why it's been important to have these individuals as part of this movement. Um, what are they doing in terms of that fight? Um, so I, I start off with uh, this image, because this is a classic image from, uh, I think CBS has reprinted it a number of times, uh, but we've also seen it, it was in Time Magazine, it was in Life Magazine, not Time Magazine. Life Magazine, it was, um, it's been shown all over because it shows this contradiction that we tend to think of when we think of the military versus peace activists. On the one hand, this is the protest outside the Pentagon um, during the Vietnam War. Um, we have an activist here uh, just labeled throughout. Everywhere I've seen, I've never found her name. I just find flower child. <laughs> and then on the left, we have the soldiers who were there that were supposed to be keeping the activists out of the Pentagon and off the steps. In fact, at one point when they had uh, breached the Pentagon, they were, put, they, they were called in to push them out. Okay, but I'm going to go back further in history, because I think that if we're going to talk about this contra contradiction, we need to think about veterans who were active, in fact, who've been activists in all kinds of different cases. So let's start with World War I. So in World War I, I'm going to talk about the case of the Bonus Army. What had happened is that World War I soldiers had been promised compensation for their service. They were not paid, like we think of in terms of uh, even drafted soldiers today. They were not paid at all. And so after the war, um, in 1924, they had lobbied for and had successfully seen a bill passed that would pay them um, $1 or a dollar, uh, if they had worked in the United States, $1 per day or a dollar twenty-five if they had worked overseas. Um, now, if a person was owed $50 or less, they were supposed to get that money immediately. If a person was owed more than $50, they were supposed to get that money at a later time. Well, they kept, as you might not be surprised, the Congress kept pushing the later time. Kept saying, oh, no, 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 you, you can deal with that. The next Congress will figure out when you're gonna get paid. And what we had uh, was individuals who never got paid, in fact. Um, and it was, even that bill had been passed over the veto of President Coolidge. Coolidge had, in fact, said that uh, patriotism isn't patriotism if it is paid. <laughs> yep, okay, so that's where we were. Um, and this situation is continuing and continuing, um, and uh, in fact, at this point, they, they were saying they were deferring it until 1945. So 1932 comes along, and a large number of World War I veterans are unemployed. And we, we see is a, formi, a former Army surgeon, goodness, I can't even talk, sergeant, not surgeon. Very key distinction there. Um, 
He was in Portland, Oregon, and he was speaking to veterans who were frustrated, some of whom were unemployed, some of whom were employed, and he said, well, let's march on Washington. Let's call ourselves the bonus expeditionary force, right? Just like the American expeditionary force had been deployed to France in World War I. So he actually got no traction when he first said this, but then the next day, the bill had been voted upon in Congress and was voted down again, and it made the news all over the United States. And from the West Coast, 250 veterans set out by train to DC. They started to make the news all over the country, and sympathetic railroad men actually helped them because these 250 people had $30 between them. That doesn't exactly get you to DC. Um, they rode in cattle cars, they were fed, by people who would meet them at the train stations. Other World War I veterans joined them from other communities. And what we saw was that we ended up with about 20,000 people outside of DC. And let me show you what this looks like, that picture in the top left. They built several shanty towns, they actually called them Hoovervilles, <laughs> all over. Uh, this was happening across the country for people who were unemployed, but they also had these all around DC, mostly in the southern parts uh, in Virginia. Um, now, of course, when they were traveling, some of them met resistance. Some of the governors didn't want to support Hoover and the Congress and tried to push them back. The veterans themselves would actually soap down the railroad tracks and they would also unhook the railroad cars because they wanted to get to DC. And what happened was a handful of governors, Ohio, Missouri, what they would do is they would put them in a bus and ship them to the state line. Well, guess what? It kept getting them further east. They were happy. <laughs> but they kept thinking, it's not my problem anymore. So here we have veteran activists um, for really what's one of the very first times that we see veterans sort of saying, no, we, de we deserve better than this. We served our country. And um, a young brig the youngest brigadier general in World War II, or sorry, World War I, it was Glassford, he actually oversaw the construction of the camps. He, when he realized they were coming, he wanted order. And so he helped to bring plywood and all the supplies needed so that people could actually live in fairly basic conditions, but at least live through the, you know, winter's a little tougher out there, just saying. We've been, we've been freaking cold here too, but uh, it's a little tougher out there. Um, the, uh, so he also solicited food and some funding to help them for this as they waited for the next round of voting to get them paid. Um, the the, um, this is in May of, of 1932, just to give you a little sense of things. Um, they had an individual who was considered their commander in chief. This is the, the sergeant from Oregon. His last name was Waters. And his, he demanded military discipline in these camps. And his rules were no panhandling, no liquor, no radical talk. That didn't keep people, including Hoover, from branding them often as communists. Um, and what, another thing that's interesting to note about these camps is that we had individuals um, who were white and black living next door to each other in segregated Virginia. This is a fascinating space. Um, now, as they waited, the bill was passed by the House to get them paid immediately. It was voted down in the Senate. Waters was able to keep them from rioting because the biggest concern was that there was going to be a riot um, by having them sing uh, patriotic songs. They actually just started singing um, and then they dissipated. And most of the 20,000 went home. There were uh, some women and children. There were whole families that had come in some cases. Um, but about, uh, I think we were left with about 2,000, uh, sometime, uh, some estimates put it as high as 8,000, stayed on for almost uh, another three months. And conditions deteriorated. 
People were no longer bringing food. Sanitation, I'm sure, was not great. Uh, we had a number of other issues. And um, in May, I'm sorry, in, uh, in October, we had uh, General MacArthur, who had been training his troops in riot control. He entered the camps, and they began what ends with what you see in this bottom corner. They burned it down. Um, they shot tear gas at the veterans, and they cleared them all the way out of Virginia. And that would be the end, unfortunately, of the bonus army. Oh, I think we're going to come. All right, cool. So after this, I want to take us to after World War II, where um, this is a, sl a very different story. I'm, uh, I think a story we can be a little bit more, again, maybe a little bit more proud of and a little happier. Um, the, uh, the historians and sociologists and political scientists who've been investigating what were some of the sparks of the civil rights movement have really started to examine how a number of leaders, including Medgar Evers, um, who was a major leader in Mississippi, whose death would also kind of inspire further activism, um, had, been, had served in World War II. And those experiences in World War II and the rhetoric, especially from the United States during and after World War II, about the importance of all people and about the what made the United States different from communism following World War II was very much about equality and about how people were treated. Now, as African Americans returned largely to the South, but also to segregated Chicago, Detroit, and other places, they, they saw a disconnect between that rhetoric and what they were living. And this encouraged several of them to join um, the movement. And this is just a quote from one of the books that's probably one of the, the best written about this issue if you're interested in examining it. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit further. Because during Vietnam, one of the um, major players in the anti-war movement were veterans. They were able to secure a great deal of attention from the media, but they were also, you would find them at the front of virtually every march. Here we've actually got a march in Texas, out near Colleen, which is the largest army base in the United States. Um, these activists were brought together um, in several different ways. There were coffee houses that anti-war activists, especially veterans, were leading in many of the large, especially army-based communities, some marine-based communities as well. Um, and they would have conversations. Um, it was some of the first conversations about what we would now think of as post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, they were also some of the early conversations about um, before even other groups were marching in the street, we had veterans talking about their experiences and whether or not they thought it matched with what was being told to the American people. Um, these individuals uh, were also uh, creating newspapers. We have found over 150 different newspapers that were underground newspapers that they mimeographed and copied, and in some cases, <laughs> try just, you know, handwriting and scribbling to pass around in the barracks. Now, you would get in a whole lot of trouble if people found that on you. But um, this is just some of the examples of the activism that the individuals were doing. Many of you might be familiar with what was called Winter Soldier, which was a series of um, testimonies put on by uh, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, which was an organization that started with six people and eventually grew to over 12,000 official members, uh, but with many, many more who would just sort of use that name but didn't think of themselves officially as members. Winter Soldiers' testimonies documented what the individuals called abuses by American troops in Vietnam. Um, they also were there to talk about uh, how America was in Laos and Cambodia and other places, some of which we claimed to not be in. Um, in the right-hand corner, we also see what was called Dewey Canyon 3. Uh, that's named after Dewey Canyon 1 and 2 were uh, when the American troops went into Laos and Cambodia. 
Um, and here we have a, a gold star mother. Someone, a gold star means that you have lost your loved one in the war. So there were a group of about 100 mothers that came with these veterans on a march that um, included coming through Valley Forge in, and then to Arlington Cemetery. When they got to Arlington Cemetery, they were carrying wreaths and they were carrying other mementos. They were denied entry. Um, they ended up laying the wreaths around the cemetery and, um, and then they continued on to the Capitol. And so uh, many of you are familiar with images of veterans throwing their medals back towards the Capitol. I'll, I'll show you an image of that in a moment. Um, that would be what resulted from the end of Dewey Canyon 3. That's the end. Okay. Now, globally, it's important to notice that veterans haven't protested just in the United States. And they haven't only protested wars. Of course, there are many issues that American veterans are, have been asking people to address and of building organizations to address issues of gender, sexuality, sometimes race. We've seen people who've also wanted to address issues of religion, such as uh, different types of freedom of religion. Um, we've seen all kinds of organizations that have developed more recently. But we've also had, um, for the last several decades, a couple of organizations in Israel that have been made up of people who have fought in um, the Israeli army, the IDF. Um, one called Breaking the Silence. It's probably one of the most controversial organizations in Israel right now. Um, they collect testimonies of Israeli soldiers who were serving in the occupied territories at different points. Um, and that organization has been very critical of Israeli policy. And then the Israeli government has also been very critical of them. Um, Combatants for Peace is a dialogue organization between um, Palestinians who've been jailed in many cases for their acts against Israel and Israeli ID former IDF members. Um, and it's, uh, those are two different organizations that have tried to connect using their veterans status. And this other one is an offshoot of the American Veterans for Peace, which I'll be talking about in a bit. Um, and it's, but they consider themselves their own group, uh, Veterans for Peace UK. Um, I want to move us to the slightly more present day and talk about particularly the Iraq War and Afghanistan. And in doing so, um, I, I need to give a little bit of context, although you guys are well aware. Remember, I sometimes teach undergraduates who, for whom none of, they, they have no memory of, they literally have no memory of, in some cases, because they were not here uh, of 9-11 and other kinds of things. So please forgive me if I, if I again, if I'm, if I'm telling you history, you know. Um, so in sociology, what we say is happening um, is, uh, that helps to shape how we think about war is that we have ways of talking about our own past, our history, and our, um, uh, what's hap our position in the globe. Those are discursive legacies. That's how the past shapes how we talk now. Sort of fancy words for that. Um, one of those discursive legacies that really shaped how people were thinking about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars had to do with the Vietnam War and how we remember the Vietnam War. Um, and we see this phrase, support the troops, sort of showing up all over the place, especially um, in uh, the yellow ribbon bumper stickers that were uh, quite, or they were magnets. We got fancy by, by this time, um, but, but we certainly had all different forms of this that would say support the troops. And then there were various versions of that in the, in the years after, um, in the, as the Iraq war continued. Um, started actually with the first Gulf War, but that's a longer story. Um, we also know, of course, that September 11th um, has in what we say it's heightened patriotism in the United States. Um, the work on this has looked at how um, flags popped up in communities that hadn't been there. So the number of flags that were shown on a street on September 10th and then September 12th would have been very different. Um, in 2001. And this continues as, uh, as the years go on. This sense of, uh, of patriotism and what that means has been sort of was rising during this period. And both of these um, are being utilized, especially during this period, 
by individuals who would like us to have a war against either Afghanistan or Iraq or both. They're using these phrases. So during this period, support for the troops largely comes to mean support for that particular war. And patriotism comes to mean, again, support for the US engaging in war. And this is facilitated through a lot of military displays that we're quite used to in the United States, but that haven't always been here. We've got marches and the ways that we handle, we no longer should say it's Armistice Day, right, which was the celebration of the end of World War I, it's Veterans Day. And we have parades that um, are usually displays of our military might and also our patriotism. Um, we have all kinds of news media that helps to get in on the gang here, right? We've got the, the heartwarming stories of people going and coming, especially these surprise stories. I'm a military spouse. You might not know this about me. It's probably something you can talk about later. Um, uh, my husband has done four deployments, and I'll tell you, if you put me on camera in that first moment where I get to see him, I would probably punch you. But that's a, a whole other story. <laughs> uh, but you have surprise, like if he showed up surprised at my work and I haven't seen him for nine months, that's going to be a, it's probably not the moment you want me on camera, I'm just going to say. Um, but you also have these moments in sporting events where we have uh, t celebrations of troops. If you've been to the Angels, the Dodgers, if you've gone to the Rams or anybody lately, you have found a, there has been a moment where you all stood up and you cheered for a particular veteran. That, and then also flybys, uh, military displays of, uh, this is actually the kind of plane my husband used to fly, so <laughs> I'm going to, it's the Super Hornet. Um, this, uh, these kinds of things are displays of military mites, many of which have been paid for by your tax dollars. You might not realize those NFL displays not being paid for by the NFL. Um, so it's an important thing, I think, to, to point out here. Um, all right. So you've got this context happening. And within this, we've developed a memory about the Vietnam War that I think we need to address because our collective memory doesn't match up with the historical record. One of these collective memories, and if I asked you how were veterans treated when they came home from Vietnam? Terribly. Who treated them terribly? media, other people said peace activists, I heard everybody a couple of times. Um, okay, uh, one of the very standard, is there something I'm doing or does it just happen? Okay, cool. Um, one of the very standard stories is that veterans would return to Travis Air Force Base, I'm sorry, veterans would return to San Francisco Airport in their uniform and would be spat upon by a woman protester. Tell me about that story. Is there anything that you hear in that story that doesn't sit well with you? Some things. So there's a couple of things. First of all, they didn't return to San Francisco International Airport. They returned to Travis Air Force Base, if they returned to that part of the country. And then they were told to get out of uniform before continuing on, and you wouldn't have flown from Travis to San Francisco International. There's not such, there is no such flight. Um, the other, another piece of this, you guys are of the right generation. Women, were you spitting in public? No. <laughs> I know we all think that hippies might have been something different than some of you maybe, but no, they were generally not Women, the women's movement hasn't even arrived yet. <laughs> At least not the 70s version of it. We had the, um, the, the, the push for the right to vote and we had other versions of it, but we haven't had <laughs> this one that would really challenge a lot of our gender norms in that way. So 
there's a, a little, I just want to show you a couple minutes of uh, one of the major scholars on this who's looked at the historical record. He's looked for, um, let me see if I can get it to do this. Can I do it? Maybe. Nope, okay. Let's see if I can do it this way. Nope. Okay, we're not going to worry about it. We're just going to, we're going to make it big again and we're going to, there you go. All right, we're not going to worry about it. Let's not worry about it. So let me briefly just summarize. So Jerry Lemke is a sociologist, also a Vietnam War veteran. And what he did was he examined the news stories of the time period. He examined uh, the movies uh, of that period, of how the Vietnam War was depicted. And he looked for, do we have any evidence of this having happened? We have lots of people who say that this happened to them. And we have lots of people who say, usually it happened to their friend. And what he found was very interesting. On the one hand, most people don't remember that veterans were part of the anti-war movement and in fact led it in many cases. That gets forgotten. That gets just written out of the history in terms of how people remember. What they do remember is this story of people being spat on. And so he looks and he looks, and he finds that this, the first telling of this story, the first time people start to talk about this in any public way, is in the 80s. And it comes after several major blockbuster films have a similar story that the Vietnam veteran talks about. And you, uh, for example, you have uh, Sylvester Stallone and Rambo talking about how I came home and they called me a baby killer. Right, and his, I, I'm trying to imitate him, I can't do it, sorry. Um, but this is not to say that people didn't say terrible things to veterans. This is to say that there appear, this, to, this appears to be a much more common story after media develops it. Now, what about how peace protesters just talked about veterans? Well, a couple of other scholars dug into the actual speeches and the recordings of speeches from peace events, and they found a couple of interesting things. Um, one, they uncovered evidence uh, in um, the media record of how it was right-wing activists that spit on v the Vietnam veterans during Dewey Canyon 3, during that march to DC. There's two, there are two news stories of that. Um, one, unfortunately, was a World War II veteran who was frustrated with these veterans who came home and protested this war. Um, they also uncovered the first use of some of these baby killers and some of these other language coming from the ways that the president and many of the people who were leading the national security industries at that time were talking about the activists. Not necessarily the veterans themselves, but how they were talking about how the activists perceived things. What they found in the speeches um, of all the recordings that we have of um, individuals who were in the Vietnam War was that those speeches were actually praising these individuals, especially those who were speaking out. They were talking about how they were, in some cases, sympathetic to veterans. So the historical record clashes with the thing that I thought I knew about the Vietnam War. It was the one thing I thought I knew, and I didn't, I'm not going to claim before I started all of this work that I felt like I knew much. But I was sure that peace protesters had been terrible to veterans. And I wanted, and I would talk about that in my own work, that I wanted to do something different. Well, that may not have been the story that we really have. Okay. It is, though, in terms of this context, I think it's got to be understood that it's really rare for someone 
who's in especially the all-volunteer force, which is what we have today, to speak out against a contemporary policy, especially a war, um, and especially a war that might be popular. Because the all-volunteer force, um, which is what we've had since the end, uh, the, largely the end of the draft, it's of course not entirely, we still have uh, men signing up for selective service, um, but we haven't instituted a draft since Vietnam. And it means that you've got several things going on. One, you've got professional soldiers. You've got people who are being paid a consistent wage. People who've largely chosen, although their economic circumstances or life circumstances might have affected those choices, and certainly do. I'm a sociologist. I'm not going to deny any of that. Um, but we've got uh, regulations that tightly control, many of them developed in the years of, Vietnam, of the Vietnam War and then afterwards, that really tightly control what military members do and say. Um, and on average, when we look at statistics, military members tend to be more conservative and more, that mean, in particular in this case, more positive towards foreign intervention with the use of force. Um, there's also a psychological component of this. How many of you like to say that you're wrong? Right? I, I've been trying to work on this. I still stink at it. I'm a peace studies professor. I should probably do it more often. I don't. But saying we're wrong and to really say that we were part of something that we might not agree with and we're not sure about really gets at the core of who we are, especially if those things were about being engaged in killing something that might, in fact, be the ultimate sort of crime otherwise. That's a real difficult thing to wrestle with that guilt and shame. The other thing that's happened with the all-volunteer force is what um, a lot of us as scholars have written about the civil-military gap. There's a gap both in terms of how the military perceives civilians, sometimes as unknowledgeable or unintelligent, lacking in knowledge about real, what it re the real world is or what war really looks like and other things of this, there is this sense that people in, the people in the military feel like civilians, you just don't know. You can't know unless you were there. There's this other side that the burdens of the war are really being borne by a very small percentage in this country. Less than 2% of the United States served since 9-11. That's a huge difference than at other points in history. The majority of individuals who have came from military families and or lived in military communities, meaning out lived near a base. It's the majority, it's not all of them. So it's a small percentage of people who really feel like they know this world. So all of this kind of means that the people I'm going to talk about now are kind of special and kind of different. As one of my uncles who served in Vietnam, uh, I should say my husband's uncle who served in Vietnam, asked me, well, aren't these just all malcontents? The truth is no. Let me start off the who are these people, who are the military peace activists, by trying to dispel that a little bit. So I looked at four main organizations. And they're organizations. They were highly organized. They had offices. They had workers. They, you know. One of them is Veterans for Peace. It's been around since the early 1980s. It was made up early on of largely Vietnam-era veterans, but also some veterans of World War II in Korea. Um, later on, it would include individuals who had served in American uh, interventions in um, the Caribbean and Central America, as well as Somalia and many other places in the Gulf War. Uh, Gold Star Families for Peace. Uh, some of you may have heard of Cindy Sheehan. Uh, she was one of the leaders of this. She was a mother who lost um, her child. I shouldn't say her, her child uh, was killed in the first year of the Gulf or of the Iraq War. And um, she, she became famous, but I'll, I won't talk about her very much, but 
we can talk about her later. Um, and um, military families speak out, made up of um, individuals who have a loved one who had served in the U.S. military since after following 9-11. Um, recognizing that military families are no longer ev or no longer potentially everyone in the country. When you don't have a draft, it's a much smaller group, and it's a sm it's a group of people who serve much longer as well. And then Iraq veterans against the war. Um, during the second year of the Iraq War, we saw this uh, group of young Iraq veterans. Um, I shouldn't say young; they're just younger than me. Um, but they were ranging in age from about 22 to 32, so very youngish, right? Uh, and they were, um, uh, they were individuals who had served in either Iraq or Afghanistan and had won um, or in the neighboring countries in support of those wars. Um, as the years would go on, and we would see that organization get to be about, just to give you a sense of things, it's certainly smaller um, than Vietnam veterans against the war, but we had up to about 6,000 different individuals who at different points would consider themselves members of that organization. And this is what I did. I did a lot of first-hand data collection. Over the course of nine years, <laughs> um, I looked at, um, I would attend virtually every event that I could go to. Um, I self-funded the majority of this, although UC Santa Barbara and a couple of other places helped out it with some smaller amounts. Um, and I collected formal interviews of a, averaging uh, close to three hours, plus uh, close to 50 informal interviews, which lasted about half an hour or so. Um, and then I did a lot of documentary analysis. As you might imagine, this is an era where you record everything. Somebody's got a cell phone, and so I was able to get a ton of media, um, both record, uh, personal recordings as well as things that were uh, put up through uh, newspapers or online, and then also different kinds of uh, paperwork that the movement itself collected. All right, so let's talk about how they saw themselves and how they felt that they were connected to the world. So on the one hand, individuals who oppose the war that they're supposed to be fighting, they're pretty much outside one of their key identity groups. These people identified with and not only worked for, but your life is wrapped up in the military when you work for them. And yet they started to feel like they were outsiders. And as some people came forward, um, some individuals were told too bad um, some individuals who said, my conscience won't let me fight in this war. Well, we don't have a system for handling that other than telling you to suck it up unless you've had such a substantial development of conscience that you can be called a conscientious objector because you oppose all wars. You cannot simply oppose one conflict or even a set of conflicts, you have to oppose all wars in order to, to uh, get conscientious objector status. Some of these individuals would go on the run. Um, we had uh, at one, one count put about 80,000. It really is difficult to count who exactly, how long do you have to be absent without leave before you're counted as a deserter, before you're considered this, were you doing it for political reasons or was there a mental health issue or was there, were you just plain scared? What was going on here? It's hard to know exactly what was going on. This is an individual who from the very beginning attempted to get uh, conscientious objector status, was denied conscientious objector status. Um, and when he was about to deploy to Iraq for his second time, he had already deployed once, um, he left. This is actually his press conference when he turned himself in. And this is the first press conference of this type where Iraq veterans against the war had decided to support people who were attempting to be objectors. They had to wrestle with this as an organization because that's a really big issue. Do you leave your friends high and dry, which is what some people would say was happening, or do you understand the sort of conscious, the wrestling with one's conscience that he was experiencing? And they decided to support. Um, 
On the other hand, peace activists aren't always as peaceful, maybe, as they should be. Um, and they didn't find these people who had served in the war always to be aligned in the ways of thinking that they held. They thought they were different in various ways, and so these peace movement individuals sometimes were writing what, uh, this is from uh, Nancy Lesson, one of the founders of Military Families Speak Out, what she had to say. She talked about getting hate mail from people on the left and um, other peace activists saying, you know, this is what you get for having, you. Th these people volunteered, they shouldn't have ever done it, and that's a really horrible thing to wrestle with. So on the one hand, these people feel like they're outsiders in both this new group that they might be part of and this older group that they've been a part of for a while. It's been a big part of their life. Sorry, I'm so used to having to go back to the computer, so I keep wondering. Um, on the other hand, these individuals felt that they are the ultimate insiders. They know what's happening with war and why war, maybe in this case or maybe in general, wasn't the answer. So they felt, we get it. We get war, but we also understand why it doesn't work. So they felt they were the ultimate insiders, and this allows them in many cases to be able to talk to people who are on the other side of the fence about the war issue, people who supported the war. This is just an image of, uh, uh, actually a former cinematographer, I'm not gonna out him, but former cinematographer who fought in the Korean War, um, who was in Santa Barbara talking to people. Um, ultimately, the way that they would come to understand themselves, this military peace movement, is as insiders and outsiders. And they would sort of try to hold this identity together, that they were special, they were unique. And this, I think this, uh, this particular uh, um, poster that veterans from, we've got Korea and World War II and Central America and Vietnam. We've got veterans from those wars, from v veterans for peace holding this particular sign. That they felt that they had a unique message and a unique experience that bonded them, despite their age differences, to military families of the contemporary era as well as veterans from the contemporary era. And so the idea was that they were insiders and outsiders together. They were the ultimate insider-outsiders. And this becomes important when you are someone who is trying to critique the war. You have to figure out how to talk about yourself. Who are you? Notice I threw in there. I thought it was important for you guys to know that I'm a military spouse. Right? That's, an, that's a piece where that gives me different credibility with some audiences. And it's true for many of these individuals. This is Colonel Ann Wright. She was serving in the US State Department when the Iraq War began. Um, she's a 30-year veteran and a, holds a JD, um, uh, quite an educated woman who had spent her life in service to the United States. She helped to reopen the American Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan after 9-11 after we had been in Iraq, or sorry, in Afghanistan. And after having left that post and hearing the rumblings in the United States about going into Iraq, she started speaking out. She l actually wrote a public letter leaving the State Department saying, I cannot support a government that's going to go into another country for no reason, and it's going to take away, she was worried about what would happen in Afghanistan as well, that turning the attention to Iraq would then mean that the attention wasn't going to be in Afghanistan. Um, and so she published, she had this letter published in several newspapers, um, and then she went on a speaking tour after leaving, talking to anti-war groups, talking to anybody who would listen about w her feelings about why the Iraq war didn't meet 
and just war justifications. And she described herself as a State Department or a foreign or a diplomat in all of these speakings, speaking engagements. She did not describe herself as Colonel, retired, and right. Until she met other veterans engaged in this work. And she saw how veterans, and you, you're here in Southern California, so you have opportunities to see some of these displays. Um, it started in Santa Barbara, but also at the piers in Los Angeles and Huntington, you'll sometimes see a display of crosses put out by Veterans for Peace. That was her first experience seeing veterans protesting the Iraq War. And she thought, this is powerful. Talking about being a veteran and protesting a war has power. And this encouraged her to re-adopt her identity as someone in the military. She realized, oh, this matters. She started wearing the camo jacket that she had in the back of her closet. Hadn't seen the light of day for quite some time. She started wearing hats. All right, so how do they manage this contradiction? Because lots of people don't understand them. Other peace activists don't understand them. Other veterans sometimes don't understand them. Other military families might question what they're doing. Well, on the one, one of the ways that they did it is by sort of reconstituting a family. They had individuals, um, so that so this is the same individual I had pictures of earlier, that's Ricky Clossing. Um, they, they had mothers from Gold Star families speak out, and sometimes fathers from military families speak out, that acted kind of as parental figures, but also some of the older veterans from Veterans Against the War. They were sort of the parental figures, and helped steer some of these new activists and then you had the younger activists who provided some of the energy and some of the impetus and a little bit, you know, kids. They're a lot more energetic. They're also, they're just a little different. And sometimes they bring a different type of idea to the forefront that can be useful. And so if you can interact in ways that support each other, and I, I have this picture because you have activists from all the different organizations actually behind Ricky here um, and acting together. So constructing that collective identity wasn't enough. You had to also work together as a family does. You had to care about each other. You had to sometimes call each other out. We had veterans who were engaged in work to help younger veterans in particular with addictions because people were self-medicating. Um, we had individuals who were working with um, families on how to keep marriages together despite deployments, despite post-traumatic stress disorder, those kinds of things. Um, and then you had actual families. In this case, you have a mother and a son, both activists. Um, Troy, on the right, had served three deployments with the Marine Corps, um, including in some of the worst fighting in Fallujah. Um, and being an activist was a way that helped some individuals transform the most negative experiences that some of these people were feeling. Some of the, the shame that we talked about earlier or the guilt that might come about and instead try to make it more positive. And so these kinds of things um, were what the families would talk about late at night. They'd sit around the campfires after an event, or they'd sit at a hotel pool and talk about, man, before I was doing this, I just, I was so angry all the time. I would get myself in bar fights because I just didn't know how to c control it. Or they would tell me things like, um, I get these nightmares, and I'm always the bad guy in my own nightmares. Um, they would talk about um, their inexplicable fears 
every time the phone rang, they were sure they were going to be hearing about their loved one having died in the war. Um, I learned during this period to carry my cell phone with me everywhere. By the way, this is not a habit I've been able to give up. Um, I dropped it in a toilet twice. Um, I it's once answered a phone call while teaching a lecture on sociological research methods because I knew it was coming from the aircraft carrier and you only get maybe one phone call <laughs> in a month period if you're lucky and if you can afford it. So you, those are the kinds of things though that you have experiences that aren't terribly positive. It's not great to feel like every time somebody pulls in the driveway you're sure they're going to tell you some bad news. And by being activists, by working together, in the interviews and in their speeches, they talked about how by finding a group, it helped them to transform those emotions. It helped them to become more loving, to think about how this wasn't about how mad they were at Bush or the government. This was about how they wanted to, to enter the world with love, how they wanted to love, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the troops, is what they would say. This is about supporting those individuals <coughs> that they wanted to express love for because sending them off to a war that they didn't think was right was not a way to love them. They developed group pride. They, started to wear t-shirts, they uh, got tattoos together, they uh, went out to eat, they saw themselves as part of the same group. And they developed, instead of an, an anger that was just directed at anybody around or was just directed at themselves, they directed it in a sort of righteous way. They started to develop arguments and were able to say, no, this problem isn't me, the problem is how the society has sent us to war, or why this is happening, and how the war was being executed. So just as an example of this, um, this is uh, uh, one of the individuals pictured on the just the last slide. Um, so I just want to give you a sense of it. Want me to read it to you? Does that help? Probably will, just to, okay. I've only been involved in the peace movement for six and a half to seven months, but working in the movement towards ending the war in Iraq has been the best therapy for me. I mean, there's no way that couldn't change you. You go from having no faith, especially from being a war vet, you go from having no faith in humanity, no faith in society whatsoever, and then you're surrounded by all these great people, and it just empowers you so much. I can, it can take you back from the brink of suicide. I can tell you personally, it can turn your life around 180 degrees. Um, Cloy had attempted suicide twice after his third deployment. Um, once on um, his military base, um, where he was essentially at that time, unfortunately, this is in the um, mid-2000s, he was, uh, I think around 2007, he was essentially just patched up and sent back. Um, again, this is before we would do much more around military suicide. That would come out a little later. Um, so let's talk about why this work matters. So it matters for a whole lot of reasons. Um, it matters because um, this was something that individuals from all across the country could talk about their experiences and when you speak as a veteran, and when you talk about American veterans, as opposed to the deaths of civilians, Americans are more likely to listen. So they've worked on ways to appeal to the American public to start to care about this war, particularly the Iraq War. And despite the numbers of deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan being substantially smaller than in previous wars, thanks to the wonderful technologies we have that have kept us largely safe, and I'm talking exclusively about Americans in this case, um, 
people can't visualize or think what a thousand looks like, right? So these kinds of displays, but then also the stories that individuals would tell, help people to get a sense of what it looks like and help to encourage them to care a little bit. You gotta, you gotta use emotion to get people to care. So they started in their home communities doing those kinds of displays, sometimes alternative displays to the traditional war memorials that celebrate war in many cases or that try to encourage people um, to think in more positive ways about the Iraq War. Um, and they also took them to Washington, D.C. Families and friends donated boots of people who had served in Iraq and Afghanistan and had passed away because of or during their service. And many of them, they were able to put pictures and stories. Um, you see a, a poppy uh, hearkening back to the Armistice Day. Um, and you get this way of personalizing it, but also trying to help people get a sense that there's a lot of people. This is, this is something that's affecting a lot of individuals. Another thing that this did, in addition to reaching out to the public, is it helped to reach out to other people in the military, military families, friends of people in the military, as well as individuals who had served in the military themselves. So these are images from um, the original display in Santa Barbara, uh, which went on for um, over 10 years. Um, and people came and they memorialized. They came to the space. Some of them held small little ceremonies as they did so. Even though there's nothing under this sand other than more sand and more, you know, more dirt, but it came to symbolize something for friends and family. We had a commander in the Seabees who came and recognized um, there were 11 people under her command who had died during one deployment. Um, so she came and wanted to um, recognize them. We had, uh, this is actually a Marine who allowed me to take his photograph, um, who was there with his, uh, his young wife, um, and they were recognizing some of the friends that he had lost during his deployments. Um, and this became a way for individuals associated with the military to feel like maybe protest isn't all but doesn't have to all be bad, doesn't have to oppose people in the military. But it also becomes a connecting emotion for those who have nothing to do with the military. This is a mother and a son who had no connection to the military. I asked them a little bit about their story. They were just on vacation in Santa Barbara. And they decided to take some time to walk through and look at the names. And she actually was talking to her son a little bit about war and what it looks like. Now, the other thing that these organizations would do is they wanted people to know, as I talked about with Anne Wright, that they were members of the military. They believe that that gives them a cultural cachet. I talked about all the military displays, the importance of supporting the troops, the importance of patriotism. So they started, they made sure that their logo was on everything. It was on hats, it was on shirts, <coughs> websites, you name it, it was a little bit of everywhere. That was one of the ways that they identified themselves as a special group. <coughs> um, and they did this in conversations as well. This is uh, Rod Brown. Um, he actually lives here in Orange County now. Um, he was living in Santa Barbara at the time. And he, he would talk about how you connect with someone and you say, hey, Here's my military experiences. And for him, it was, I'm ex-Navy, da, da 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 these are the years I served, these are where I served, this is the kind of thing that I did. And then you talk about the politics. You don't lead with, right? I'm sure you guys love it when people just come up and be like, you know who you should vote for, right? Nobody wants that. Let's get to know me. I don't care what you have to say if you're a total stranger. Tell me a little something. Give me some sense that you've got credibility. Um, and this was something that the veterans did. They also, this is a little less about the uniforms, although you would see these as well, they would put it on their clothes. And that means if you're wearing that to work or if you're wearing it to 
uh, walk around town or get the groceries or whatever it might be, you want people to know some of these things about yourself. So as I said, um, this is uh, one, of my, one of the people I got to know quite well. He was a Korean War veteran. Um, and he had these, and then he also had his Veterans for Peace button on that side, just so people knew what their experiences were. This was the Military Families Speak Out shirt that integrated the peace logo with the yellow ribbon, sort of combining these things, telling people you could do both. You could oppose war, you could fight for peace and um, the troops. Up here we have Melita Arredondo wearing the shirt uh, uh, that shows her uh, s uh, stepson who was killed in Iraq. Um, and so you have different ways of doing this in addition to the uniforms, the different official pieces of uniforms. Some people wore them, other people saw that it technically breaks military codes, so they wouldn't do it, depending, so some individuals would and some wouldn't. Um, that's Cindy Sheehan here. Um, we've also got a uh, famous folk singer on the right. Some of you might be able to identify her. And we've got, um, yeah, <laughs> by us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was just teasing. <laughs> um, and then we have um, Jeff Key in the middle. He was in the Marine Corps, had served in Iraq, um, and they were playing taps, right? So you also, there would be, they would use things that people associate with the military, including certain types of music. When, when they engaged in a peace march, right, these folks know how to march. You're not just like willy-nilly going everywhere and everybody's at their own pace. No, you sing cadence, right? Hey, hey, Uncle Sam, we remember Vietnam. We don't want your Iraq war. Bring our troops back to a shore things like that. Okay, I don't have a very good voice, I'm sorry, but, uh, um, <laughs> but this, that's the kind of thing that they would do. It's a call and response. I was doing it more quickly, but usually I would say a line, you would repeat it back to me, and it helps you to keep pace, right? And they would do it. Boy, they looked a little different than a lot of other people in these marches. So they were acting the part. They were intentionally keeping each other in line. They would also reclaim symbols and claim them for themselves. They would claim things like the flags, the boots, even the crosses, although that assumes everyone in the military is Christian, which is a whole other problem that we, the people would address at other periods, and that's a whole other issue we should definitely talk about, but that's a little later. And this is uh, a group that would occasionally also put up their um, crosses outside of Pendleton. At Camp Pendleton, um, these, this was uh, Veterans for Peace San Diego. Um, they one time had a whole truck whose back bed was filled with Marines that came out to them as they were starting to set up their display on public property. And they were like, oh boy, here we go. And instead, the guys asked to help. And they were shocked. <laughs> because that's not the story that most of us know, again, about how veterans and peace activists interact. But these individuals wanted, they had just gotten home, and they wanted to have a way to remember those that they had passed. And they were willing to listen, or at least think about some of the problems that might have been happening in Iraq. We know that um, by about 2007, close to half of the people in the US military felt that we shouldn't have gone into Iraq. So these kinds of tactics and techniques did change some of the attitudes of individuals. And it did help to combat some of the ways that people remember that Vietnam era. Um, because individuals who are not members of the military community well, maybe you've got an ulterior motive, or maybe you're, you don't really understand the cost. You don't really get it. Um, and so there was a way that it, they were given um, an opportunity to combat the negative image of peace protesters, of anti-war work, of people who were doing the work of anti-war. And ultimately, it goes back to some of those discursive legacies I talked about at the beginning. 
they were able to redefine what it meant to be supportive of troops. Does it mean, does troop support in their language, and as they would talk about it, they would say this is street theater that they did in major cities, mostly East Coast, although also Denver. I don't believe it ever happened in Los Angeles. Um, DC, Chicago, a bunch of other places, uh, Minneapolis. Um, they would not use real guns, but they would pretend that they were on patrol as they would in urban areas of Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, it could be quite frightening, quite frankly, if you weren't prepared for it. Um, and that was their intention. They wanted people to understand what war looks like. Um, these individuals had lots of things to say about what troop support really was. They talked about troop support means a population who pays attention to the wars that it's asking their people to fight in. A population that investigates whether that's the best potential policy for people to, to be engaged in. A population that's willing to pay for veterans benefits when those individuals return, understands the physical and mental health needs of its veterans, willing to do the research, willing to examine the, the suicide rate that we've been seeing, which is not necessarily active duty members of the military or even Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, but rather we'd been see, we have been seeing that the majority of the, of the uh, skyrocketing suicide rates have been among Vietnam era veterans. Um, so they wanted people to rethink what troop support looked like. And early on, one of the other critiques was also that you shouldn't send people into battle without the proper equipment because that was a major issue also that led to a lot of deaths early on in terms of faulty Kevlar vests, faulty, um, uh, there was a lack of water that some groups were, uh, some particular uh, communities were facing. There was um, all kinds of uh, sort of lack of plans, all kinds of things that people felt were, were mishandled in the early years of the Iraq war in particular. And they also wanted Americans to rethink patriotism and to uncouple it from being the global war maker. They wanted people to rethink who you question who, and to feel that it's okay to ask the tough questions. If you're gonna send a nation to war, especially a war that now is going to have cost us into the tens of trillions of dollars. Trillions, again, we can't imagine a thousand, how do we imagine a trillion? Um, and to think instead about what is the oath to the Constitution that members of the military take? Um, it has to do supporting the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And they ask, is the enemy domestic if individuals are making up lies about wars or are engaging in um, skewing how the American public sees a particular issue in a way that goes against the historical record or against what we know to be true. So just to conclude, because although I guess I'm a little early, I went faster than I meant to, sorry about this. That means you can ask me questions. Um, Number one, I think we need as a population to consider ways that activists and veterans are not polar opposites. And in fact, can be the same people and have some of the same concerns and care for the country. Um, it's also important to think about how movements in general can get us to rethink what we know about an issue. This has happened before on so many issues when it comes to civil rights or women's rights or all kind, uh, even gay marriage these days. There's a lot of different ways that people are thinking that are in part intentional. And they've done this by claiming authority and by involving individuals who can do that. So you might involve scientists 
if you're talking about an issue such as climate change, which we've seen. You might involve clergy if you're talking about issues of marriage or, um, or families, and we've seen that. Um, and you have to also make smart decisions about how you talk about issues, what we call framing the issue. How do you get people to care about the piece of it that you want them to care about? Using flags and other sorts of symbols helps to do that. When people already care about patriotism, you have to use the language that they care about. When they care about troop support, we'll talk about what troop support, what does that mean? And start to shift the, uh, that language. Um, and then also, you can't just be the stereotypical angry protester. Appealing to emotions such as having a little fun, well, that helps to build the family I talked about that was so important to keep these people active and together in the movement. You also need to talk about grief. We've got to talk about um, love and the world we want to create, not just the things that we don't like. You got to think about how you can get those connecting emotions. What are the things that are going to connect people one to another? And then you want to create a space where people can keep doing it. One of the difficulties with this movement was it relied so heavily on its young Iraq War veterans in particular to be the public face. It's exhausting. Those individuals were at the key moments of what should have been their key sort of money-making moments of their careers. And instead, you're asking them not to get paid and to go around the country speaking about the most difficult parts of their lives. It's really hard to maintain. So you've got to think about how do you do this. Some of it involves having fun, but you've also got to build in support systems for those individuals. And you've got to help empower them in various ways, making sure that they're able to get the education they need, the kind of financial support they might need. Because if you've left the military, you've given up a whole lot of benefits. So you need to think, what does that empowerment look like beyond just feeling good about oneself? All right. Leave space for lots of questions. And again, I'm sorry. I talk fast. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, you are. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lights. It's been great. Um, we're going to have a, a little bit of time for questions. Just give us a minute to get the microphones out. Okay. Does anybody have a question? Just, just go ahead and raise your hand. <laughs> and I'm following. Do we have a mic? Oh, yeah, right, right here. Go ahead, right down here. Uh, uh, Dr. Lights, this in no way conflicts with, with your excellent presentation. But many okay. of us here in Laguna Woods Village who are veterans were draftees. Yeah. Whereas the modern army, they're almost all volunteers. Mm -hmm. And I, I speak for those of us who were draftees. We were not angry as veterans. We were delighted to get out and continue with our lives. Our anger was directed against the regular army while we were in the army. So there are almost two different categories mm -hmm. of people, the draftees who represented, for the most part, the middle class, and the regular army who came from small towns, rural areas of the South. In other words, two different categories yeah. of soldiers. Mm -hmm. Would you care to, is that, that's not the case today because it's almost all voluntary. It's true, um, and, and so if I could, uh, if I could address that um, one of the major issues of the Vietnam era um, and one of the pieces of anger was about the draft in general um, and not just the, the difficulties that that would then create between people who were seen as the regular army um, or, and who were often given um, senior positions um, versus those individuals who were draftees and often put into more junior positions. Um, so, so I'll address both of those issues. On the one hand, one of the major successes that people ha saw from uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement was that it ended, it by and large, ended the draft. For all intents and purposes, we are not using the draft. And people saw that as an unfair situation. 
um, that people shouldn't have to fight in wars uh, unless they wanted to. Now, um, the, so I will, I will put that there, that the draft itself was a major issue, not just, um, and so the sense that I didn't choose this in any way, shape, or form. The second issue, and I'll, I'll come back to the Iraq War in a minute. Let me, let me get to the Vietnam. Um, and then the, the other thing that you bring up is this major disconnect, especially between in, uh, those that were lower level soldiers and the, the way that they felt they were treated, especially by the officers. And a lot of that had to do with people who were, you know, who, who, for whom the military was a career and those who were drafted. And they were seen, there was a lot of uh, fighting. Um, in, in fact, the word fragging was uh, developed to talk about how certain officers were often killed by, um, especially, uh, by their uh, soldiers during Vietnam. Um, th this would be on the nightly news and other kinds of conversations. The military drafted, um, as far as I know, at least 15 position papers about how to try to stop it. Um, it's, these were major issues. The draft was massively unpopular. The thing that you should understand, and I'm just gonna give a little bit more historical context, is that that's not unusual. Drafts are often unpopular. They had to drag people kicking and screaming, especially into World War I, but also into the Civil War in many cases. So both of those, especially the drafts, were in place. The draft was also in place for World War II, although we have sort of changed the way we remember World War II soldiers. Many of them weren't like, woohoo, here I go off to a place I've never heard of to fight Japanese, which I can't distinguish from the people who are living in that place because they didn't know. They had never seen these people before. So that's, uh, that's, just, that's one piece that I think it's important to point out. The, the soldiers today are, yes, uh, what we call the all-volunteer force, which is made up of individuals who have chosen to go into the military. Um, I think what we should understand about these individuals is that when you signed up for the military, many of them signed up um, before 9-11 and some of them signed up with the sort of uh, rush of patriotism after 9-11. They thought they were going to fight against those people who had committed terrorist attacks, those people in the rush of patriotism right after 9-11, and they thought, um, which had nothing to do with the Iraq War, but was used as a reason to get us into the Iraq War. Iraq would the leadership of Iraq would never support Afghanistan. It's a, if you understand anything about or the M Middle East, that was an obvious thing, but it wasn't obvious to most Americans. Um, and so many of those soldiers felt they were lied to and that that was the wrong war. So that's part of this. There was a sense of betrayal that I didn't get to talk about here, but that I talk about in my book a good deal more. There was a sense that they felt betrayed by the policies of their country. Um, the other piece of this is that we were using a whole lot of policies that forced people to stay, be in, to stay in the military beyond their contracts uh, during the Iraq War, that people felt like it was similar to the draft. Um, they were being forced uh, through pro uh, policies of stop loss and then also pulling people out of what's called the individual ready reserve. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, they were using those two things in particular a great deal in the early years of the Iraq War, which kept people in when those people felt that they had served their commitment. And the individual ready reserve, just so you understand, is a time period in one's life um, after you have served your official commitment to the military where you could be called back if your special skills are needed or if an emergency develops. You're not being paid, you're not drilling, and so most young people have no idea they're even in the individual ready reserve, especially after the first year. If you've ever looked at military paperwork, right, tell me you've read all of the tax laws, right? Yeah, similar. So this, so those, that's a couple of things that were going on. Another thing that, that's happening is that at 18, some th the, the language was that you were gonna learn to be a man or you were gonna learn to uh, some sort of skill that got you a job and, or be able to earn money for education. And prior to 9-11, you thought you were entering a service that sure, you might do a little support of the US or the global community here or there, but you didn't think you were gonna fight in a globally unpopular war. 
And many individuals, especially as they came to understand more about Iraq, either having served there or when they came home, felt that this was not the war that the US should be fighting or that we were fighting in the wrong way or that we were doing something wrong in some kind of capacity, either morally or um, in terms of just war theory. So there were a couple of things that went on and I would agree that they're different. It is a fundamentally different time period during the all volunteer force than it was during a draft period. Good point. Thank you. Up here at the top. Yes. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, uh, war has to be declared by Congress. Yeah. I also understand no war has been declared mm -hmm. <laughs> since World War II. Mm -hmm. And um, I wish you to address that because supposedly the United States has to be threatened for us to go to war. Sure. And I don't think uh, Viet Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan or Iraq threatened the United States. Yeah, so, um, and that is part of the arguments that many of these individuals would come to make. Some of these individuals were officers who for any number of reasons were asked to investigate aspects of policy. Um, some individuals were um, enlisted who simply started reading in different ways and came to the same conclusions. Um, that this was an illegal war either according to the US Constitution thus the, the sort of language about the Constitution, or it was a war, in fact, that was hurting people rather than helping or doing things that they felt um, actually made global peace or even peace for the United States less likely. And those are the kinds of um, arguments that these individuals were making quite regularly. Um, I think you highlight um, one of the major problems right now about uh, the way that we are currently engaged in the global world. Um, part of the language of terrorism and, and, and other things that we use on, in our foreign policy has kept us from officially declaring war in many places, but also it then protects politicians who want to be able to say, I didn't, well, I didn't declare war, and yet they keep funding it. And so I think um, you know, again, I, I would ask, you know, and I, I think this, you, I think both my undergraduates and you guys, everyone should be looking at where do your tax dollars go. Over half of it goes in some way, shape, or form. A half of our discretionary spending, I should be clear, goes to the military. Half through veterans care, which is just going to keep getting expensive, more expensive as people come back from these wars. Um, it goes to payment to the current military as well as to these wars themselves. Um, it also, it gets, it's hidden away in places like the Department of Energy, which, because they have to monitor many of our um, nuclear weapons. But that's an extraordinary amount of money that could go to other things. And so if the, if, if the conclusion you come to is that the war wasn't worth it, then it's not just a waste of lives, it's also a waste of monetary treasure, too. Thank you. Up here on the left side, move around the room. Go ahead. Um, yes, uh, I am a veteran, and while I was on active duty, I did demonstrate in a, in a demonstration, or at least I attended one. Mm -hmm. And several years later, I began to think about a little dichotomy between my the personal rights and the public good and what's good for me and what's good for the nation. Yeah. And this is probably very much outside the scope of your studies, but I finally came to one conclusion or question, which I'm going to ask you, mm -hmm. is how do you think the peace movement in general has affected our adversaries? Sure. Would you like to address that issue? Or? Sure. Okay. Sure, um, and I know that this is a, a, a very common um, concern, both in looking back at the Vietnam War as well as looking at the contemporary wars. Um, I, I think there's no doubt that um, when people see uh, others who come to the same conclusion in another ethnic group or in another country, especially if that country is supposed to be your enemy, there's a feeling of, oh, well, I must be doing something right. Um, that said, I think in the contemporary wars, 
Um, and I, I won't speak as much about Vietnam. I'll, I'll encourage Dr. Jinks to bring in uh, Dr. Dadis from Chapman, who is a colleague of mine and one of the leading scholars on the Vietnam War. He runs our Warren Society master's program. Um, so he can speak better on that one. But I think uh, when it comes to the current wars, who that enemy is continues to shift. Um, early in, let's just take Iraq, uh, we might talk about this in terms of Saddam Hussein. There was a very minimal, uh, one, before the war, there was a large international and United States peace movement. Once the war in Iraq started, it pretty much dies because the language of support the troops means that you can't continue to, to protest. And then it pops really back up around um, early 2005. There's still people who are protesting, but not like it was before. And then it really rises for another couple of years. Um, by those couple of years, Saddam Hussein's out of the picture, and we've got other individuals who are leading. And that continues to shift over the next several years in Iraq. So how exactly those individuals felt about protesters, I don't know. Um, I think uh, that when it comes to this question of should, uh, should protesters do what they're doing because it gives comfort and aid to the enemy, I think that that's not the right question. I think the right question is, do our policies create more peace or less peace, both for us and the international community? And our policies in Iraq and Afghanistan unfortunately destabilized that region um, and have led to an increasing number of deaths and wars around that region and our own CIA as well as many other uh, national security agencies have written policy papers about how it increased the likelihood of terrorist attacks inside the United States. So that means it made us less safe as well as making the world less safe. And for me, I think that's, that's the bigger question. Um, I, I think that we're going to find that people like or dislike subsections of other populations. Um, but the idea that you're ever going to have a population that's all on one side in favor of one policy issue, I think that feels super un-American. <laughs> uh, because dis I, I should be clear. I think we should disagree civilly, it'd be nice if our politicians could. <laughs> so, I'll leave it Thank you, it's a great response. Over here. Uh, is the, uh, the veterans peace movement that, that you described, is it conflict specific, like anti-Iraq, anti-Syria, sure. whatever, or, or is it because of their experiences in, in whatever conflict they were in, does it, does it lead them to be anti-war, just in general, anti-conflict sure. in general? Because still a fairly small group of people. It the is. majority of the military, their response is, is, would not be uh, uh, in this way, right? So the majority of veterans still poll to be in favor of U.S. intervention in different ways. Not necessarily in terms of Iraq. That has shifted over time. The support for Iraq shift has, has dramatically shifted. Um, so, so I should be clear that if you look at a specific one. Um, however, it's always a small population that goes into the streets or joins an activist organization, no matter the issue. Even when we talk about civil rights, the vast majority of Southern blacks did not go into the streets. We had less than 3%, in fact, who joined the civil rights movement. So that's an important point, I think, to make, because sometimes we think that everybody was getting into the streets, and not, it's not accurate. Um, the other thing that, so to, so to go back to your, your question, though, about um, these organizations, these ones specifically, v Vietnam Veterans Against the War and Iraq Veterans Against the War, they were established with an initial focus on a particular conflict. Uh, VVAW, the Vietnam Veterans, um, they continued to organize around issues of post-traumatic stress and other issues following Vietnam, but they were a much, much smaller organization. They are still active today, although again, a some smaller subsection of them. Just like many people join a movement at a certain moment and then you leave because you've got kids, you've got life, you've got other issues that are, seem more important. Um, but they, there are a number of people who've continued to be active and they opposed the Iraq war and then later on the Afghanistan war. Um, 
Veterans for Peace was established in the 80s as a more general focus. And the idea was to use the MacArthur quote um, that because we've seen war, we know the importance of peace. So we want, as veterans, to sort of use that voice and use that experience to um, examine how conflict um, can be solved in a more peaceful way as opposed to using, uh, using war. So it depends on the organization. Um, and so that makes Veterans for Peace very different from Iraq Vets Against the War or Military Families Speak Out that, were, that pop up about a very specific issue. You see this in the environmental movement, for example, where you have major organizations that address um, the environment writ large, and then you have an organization that wants to just take care of a particular beach or just take care of a particular oil spill or something. Thank you. We have time for about three more questions. Let's go back up here to the top. Yes, I have. Um, what, 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 <clears throat> if I don't want to say anything, and I don't intend to say anything that um, is uh, offensive towards the veterans of, the, the, for example, the Vietnam War and this current war. Um, but during the Vietnam War, there was a lot of protest by the public protesting <laughs> against the war. Yeah. And I think part of the reason was it was mostly poor people um, and um, lesser educated that were getting drafted in. The, the, the wealthier people could figure out ways to get out of it. During the Eisenhower administration, Eisenhower warned against the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. So th this is leading to this current uh, thing where now the war veterans that are fighting the current war are not being drafted. They're, um, they're in, in it by, them, by, by their own voluntary. And the issue is, I think the military was very smart doing that because it eliminated the protest. We wouldn't have the protest we had during the Vietnam War yeah. because the, these people that are in the war now are voluntary. Absolutely, I make the same argument um, uh, in, in some of my work and, in, and sometimes some of my conversations with some colleagues I was even showing you on the screen, that without the draft, um, you didn't end up with as large of a peace movement during the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars. Um, and however, people who enter the US military today, um, while the majority of them come from military families, they also tend to come from what we call um, the lower middle class or the working class. Um, they don't come from the very bottom because there is a requirement of having um, a, a high school degree but they do come from a much lower segment of society than who goes to college today and other kinds of things. So there is still, um, what people talk about, there are still economic incentives for going into the military. And who goes is different than who goes to college or who goes into the workforce immediately after high school. So I think that's an important thing to point out. And I think, but I think you're right in terms of the important role that the draft plays. Um, and that doesn't mean that when people serve in the military, they don't feel strongly about their country, but there are lots of reasons why one serves, and draft might be one. Hoping to get health care for your family might be another one. So I, does that answer? Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Right over here in the top. Uh, being a veteran uh, in active duty is different than just being in the service. Mm -hmm. When the draft was in force, it equalized many mental situations of the draftees. Sure. Some came from upper class, did have no idea about how the other people lived. Mm -hmm. Now they were forced to live with those people and found that there was a lot of commonality, not necessarily differences, mm -hmm. and that they all had to follow the same <laughs> order. The SOP, or Standard Operational mm -hmm. Procedure, was not geared to the brilliant people or the ignorant people. It was between the two so that you could be a homogeneous fighting force. Yep. This is the important part of the draft. It made some equality, that when you came out of the service, you were less biased, you were less bigoted, you were more encouraging for the American dream 
of all people, and we've lost that because now money, no matter how you cut it, is the issue. Mm -hmm. I can't get a job, I'll go in service. Sure. I, I uh, want to, it, it, it's the bottom line to everything. There's no way you can get away from money. Now, our leadership for four presidents have never been in active service. Mm -hmm. They've sometimes taken counsel and sometimes not. And we have a Congress situation, the balance of powers have not been what they should be across the board as our checks and balances. So I can't blame any one thing. We're deceived by false information and nobody has the strength in organizing a reasonable fact based situation for our involvement. It is so complex. Mm -hmm. It is not a simple one-way answer like Vietnam where protests were clear. Since then we've had the Korean War, mm -hmm. Afghan, Iraq. You know, I don't know where to go and I'm getting more and more confused daily. Can you tell me a <laughs> pathway to more logical <laughs> <laughs> action of our military, sure. uh, if you see what the, General Mattis did, mm -hmm. and, and he was ostracized yeah. for that, and yet I praise him for sure. that. He had enough. There's well, a whole anyway. lot there. I could, I could, I'm Thank sure, you. You know, uh, as a professor, I don't lack for words usually, so sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'm gonna just take just a quick second and say, um, I think part of the answer lies in working with, not against, the international community. Um, and I know that that's uh, not always a popular answer, but I think um, trying to go it alone, either in terms of a war or a foreign policy, um, means that if people disagree, your only option then is to go to war, as opposed to working in some kind of capacity for an agreement. Um, a diplomatic agreement or a legal agreement through the International Court of Justice. We've seen on the border of Costa Rica um, an example of uh, a country that has turned to the International Court of Justice multiple times because the border between Costa Rica and Nicaragua has been contentious for a long time. So they've gone to the International Court of Justice, um, I believe three occasions, two official decisions, and no war. Um, and it's possible to find other ways, but we have to think of ourselves as part of, not the only ones in that community. That's one potential way. The other thing, I think we have to look at um, the constitutionality of the use of um, what we call the uh, contractors, which is a nice euphemism for mercenaries. These are, individuals that we're using to avoid the draft. These are people that aren't, in many cases, US citizens. We've been using a lot of individuals in units from South America and from the Middle East itself. We are training and arming, essentially, militias all over the world to then fight the wars for us. In many, uh, during Obama's administration, the way he was able to lower troops in Iraq was by increasing our use of contractors. In fact, we had more contractors in Iraq during that period than we had troops. Hmm. Um, we currently have more contractors in both Iraq and Afghanistan than we do US service members. Hmm. They are not held to the US Constitution. They are not able to be sued. We've been seeing consistently or even their companies cannot be sued when their own employees find themselves without medical benefits or what we would think of as traditional benefits um, or are assaulted or other kinds of things. Um, so we, we have some real problems um, in terms, and some of them do come down to money. I think there's a lot more there, but I think, um, I, I think those are two things we have to take a really hard look at. Um, what is the way that we interact with the world? And even if it's just our closest neighbors, what's the way that we do it? 
and how do we do it in a way um, that increases the likelihood for a peaceful solution rather than a war-based solution. Excellent. Let's start with Lynn <laughs> down here, please. Um, I is I have uh, I'm a mother of veterans. I'm the uh, who saw active combat daughter of a active combat veterans sibling of combat. So the military has been a factor in my life, my entire life. I'm concerned that the nature of conflicts has changed, and I'm concerned with the use of the contractors about the Geneva Convention. It seems as if it doesn't matter anymore. And the other part of it is as the nature of war changes to remote um, imaging and military action, i.e., we got people sitting in the United States playing literally war games and causing real life death. And without the nastiness and grit of war, do we really understand, will the military understand the nature of the power and the harm that it is being wrecked on them as well as on their victim? I have concerns about that as well. I don't have answers. I have m mostly concerns. Um, my husband, as I said, was an F-18 uh, fighter pilot who flew uh, close to 200 missions over Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, he he has more than 400 landings on an aircraft carrier. He you know did he did his time as a pilot, but even he talks about how distant he was. He doesn't see himself in the same category as people who are on the ground in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and then beyond that, you have individuals who are in Oklahoma dropping bombs elsewhere um, uh, through drones or other kinds of, of, of um, <laughs> we have all kinds of toys these days. Um, we've spent a lot of money on these uh, things. Um, the, I don't know that it makes me feel any better, but drone pilots are experiencing a rate of double PTSD the, um, of, of other pilots. There seems to be perhaps a disconnect in the moment, but that connect happen, or that connection happens later, and that might in fact be more dangerous for those individuals. Mm -hmm. This still doesn't, I think, help us to get over the fact that as a nation, we have not experienced war on our own soil. Um, in the ways that we saw in Pearl Harbor. 9-11, it's not quite the same as a consistent and sustained war where your children cannot go to school for years or months at a time, where you're constantly worried about the sanitation issues or other kinds of things. That's a very different scenario, like what is being experienced in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, you name it. Um, and we could name many other places, um, and so that matters. And it, I think it, I think it is concerning because I shouldn't, I as a peace study scholar shouldn't have to go to my students. War is bad. Here's why war is bad. I know you've seen lots of war movies, but even when war does something good, the experience of it is bloody, gory death. That's, but the students in the United States have grown up largely with films that have sanitized it. And so I worry about sanitation of something that is fundamentally a condition of, the, of people that we need to, to work on. Yeah. I uh, would love to tell you that they're still holding in a way that makes me feel confident. But I, um, what I'm seeing are nations, especially those that, are, that have been as they've tried to pull out of international communities that monitor those conventions, um, they have no way to enforce them, which is terrifying, quite frankly, especially if those nations are powerful. One final question back here. I wanted to ask you about uh, symbols. Sure. Uh, well, I lived in Massachusetts, and during the Iraq War, there was the display of boots and pictures on the Boston Common. Mm -hmm. And the people that put it up, I thought, kind of disingenuously said it was not an anti-war statement. 
They just wanted to honor the people who had fallen and they wanted people to realize the cost. On the other side, there were people who were completely outraged that uh, they were using these military, mm -hmm. I'll call them symbols, these, these military symbols to bring forth an anti-war effort. And it struck sure. me that both sides wanted to use these symbols for advertising. Sure. Uh, and I wonder how important you feel the use of these symbols is and how appropriate you feel sure. the use of these symbols are in the fight for, I call it the propaganda fight. I guess sure. that's really what it is. Sure. Um, I, I can't speak specifically about the folks in Boston. What I can, um, I, I know some of the people who put on some of those displays, but I don't know about, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly which day or which place um, it would have been that you're talking about. But I can tell you, um, I, I also think it would be disingenuous of, of, of if you're an anti-war organization putting these symbols out there, of not talking about who you are. That would feel very disingenuous. Um, Veterans for Peace in Santa Barbara, who started doing that um, and, and sort of systema systematized it for Vets for Peace, um, they were able to do it in a way that very clearly claimed who they were, both as veterans and peace activists. Um, I think symbols are incredibly important to any rhetorical fight or discursive fight where we're going to talk about what, what's happening um, at a moment around a policy. Um, whether you're using them for war or anti-war, they are symbols of, of people, if you're talking about boots. <coughs> They're symbols of the country, if you're talking about flags. Um, and it just depends on, on the particular symbol. Um, I think uh, I have appreciated some of the groups that have reached out to people who've lost individuals. <coughs> Sorry, and have allowed them to say whether or not to use their names or any sort of likenesses before using them. Um, I think using a symbol um, is absolutely intended as a propaganda element, and you can take that in a positive or negative way, depending on if you like the the message being made. Um, but symbols are always in use. Sometimes we don't even notice it. Um, I think it's more of a matter of, um, in, my, in my opinion, I think organizations that want to make peace um, have to find ways to do it honestly. That's my personal opinion. Let's give a warm round of applause for Dr. Lights. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming today. I want to remind you next week we're not meeting.